the Shields webinar is starting at 5.09 tonight. Um, <laughs> and so we're going give to give that another shake out. Uh, again, uh, for those of you guys who uh, didn't catch the early part, please make sure you're, you're, you're muted and videos are off. Everybody's been behaving themselves really well with that. So uh, we'll give it a run here. And um, let's go to the next slide and see if we're, are we moving along? Yes. Yep. All right, and another, hey, listen, there's nothing wrong with telling people to join the class twice. So uh, remember to join the Shields class, shieldsclass.com, and uh, get your dues in for the year. Keeps the class running, and uh, make sure we can we can get all supported. Okay. And uh, we, these are, for those of you who couldn't see the slides, there's our presenter today, uh, current national champion, uh, Tim Dawson, Will Wells, and Tim Healy. And we talked a little bit about the mass setup. Thank you, Tim. And uh, we're going to just uh, circle back here real quick, Tim, because uh, I know you were talking about CLR and CLE yes. and kind of resistance and stuff like that. I think it's a pretty big deal with the with the shields, especially how yeah. confined the sale plan is. So maybe you can kind of go from there. And yeah. So I'll show. just I'll, I'll, I'll quickly recap. And uh, it, the idea is to rake, get your uh, mass rake rake back as far as you can legally. Now there's a, a, a measurement process for, for that that we'll quickly touch on next slide. But uh, basically you'd like to get your rake back uh, as far as you can to get the center of lateral resistance and the uh, center of later, lateral effort as close as, as possible. So they're in this drawing, they're spread apart. And um, looking at this, at this rig, it, it looks to me like you could use some rake to rake it back a little bit and get those closer. And that'll, that'll be a, a more balanced boat. And the other thing um, uh, that we touched on is light air. You want a flexible uh, mast and, uh, for, for giving flexible and powerful setup. And in heavy air, you want a stiffer mass um, and you want to obviously start to depower but a stiff mass is what you're looking for in, in heavy air. And um, the lowers are what actually, uh, that's the uh, adjustment that you can make to make the mass stiffer and heavier. You tighten up the lowers and it, uh, you can see they're just behind the mass there. So they'll restrict the bend forward. And in light air, you ease those off and let the mass bend a little bit more freely. Um, so those are the keys. And then the other you know, big part of that is, is the uh, head stay adjustment, but we'll cover a little bit more of that in a minute. So the next uh, slide here is, is the class measurement form. Um, we don't have to get into this too much, but it does illustrate the important parts of what you're trying to do here. And remember the, the shield's mass is, is it's a big section, it's a stiff rig. So what we're trying to do is, you know, rake it back and the way to do that is to move it as far aft as legally possible at the deck and push it as far forward as possible at the mast step. And by doing that, obviously it'll rake back um, as much as, as legally possible. Now. The, the, the key factor to that is, um, next key factor, once you do that, is to get the head stay set right. Because the head stay, what that's going to do is dictate in light air how much the mass is allowed to bend back. And in heavy air, it's going to restrict it from bending aft, but also allow you to get a nice tight head stay and keep the jib shape flatter. So if you have a saggy head stay when it's windy, it's a problem because the jib's way too powerful. You need a nice tight head stay when it's windy and the way to do that is to have a shorter head stay, tighter lowers, a lot of back stay. Um, so Tim, but Tim, Tim, real quick, if I could yeah. just stop. This came right out of the Shields uh, class book and it's just yeah. a page out of there. And yes. you know, you're talking about maximizing X and making sure kind of Y is as short as you can. Uh, best bet for folks that are maybe trying to make that happen or just getting it back into the boat. I know we got a couple of new fleets uh, 
coming up uh, around the country. Maybe touch base with a, with a measurer or try to reach out to somebody who could kind of help them get those measurements in the right spot. Does that make the most yeah. sense? Yeah, exactly. And it's a good, you know, this is great that the class went through and, and came up with this form and have, has this formula. So everybody gets pretty, uh, pretty close on these measurements. Okay, so okay. next slide. So, uh, well, you is, wanted to, yeah, go ahead. You wanted to just talk about maybe, uh, you know, uh, I know that Will had uh, yeah, spent a I, lot of time with Chad, right? Yeah, exactly. This is, so this is the part about the head stay that this is the, the next key um, piece, piece of the puzzle is getting the head stay right. And, you know, talking with Will, he had a good experience kind of going through this with Chad Proctor a couple years ago. So, uh, Will, why don't you take it from here? Yeah, no, uh, Chad and I were out sailing a couple summers ago looking at uh, mains and jibs on the shields and uh, you know Chet had a pretty pretty cool way of just double checking uh, if he liked uh, the rake and the pre-bend uh, at, at base on the mooring and uh, I thought it was pretty slick I thought we should add it to the the tuning guide and I'll, I'll happily go through it right now but basically uh, with the uppers at uh, base, which is 800 pounds, uh, and the lowers at 300, uh, you uh, pull the back stay on to get the head stay tight. And uh, if you've got a PT2 loose gauge, you put that on the head stay, and, uh, and, and then you want to pull the back stay on so that it reads 7.8-ish, so 7.28. And uh, so that's uh, no jib on the head stay, nothing hanked on. Uh, and then uh, uh, you take the uh, pre-bend tool. You need some sort of uh, contraption to, to measure the pre-bend. And uh, we've got a, a, a pretty slick um, ruler that's got a little piece of bolt rope on it. There's a picture of it there. And uh, you, you basically, it goes up the, the groove in the mast. So we, we hook the, uh, the spinnaker halyard because you're gonna need your main halyard to measure the pre-bend. So hook the spinnaker halyard on the top of the gauge and then you have a little safety line on the bottom so you can pull it back down after you've, you've measured it. But put the gauge in and where we wanna measure is roughly uh, three feet up above the spreaders. That's maximum uh, bend in the shields mass. And uh, we're looking for uh, roughly three to three and a half inches of pre-bend. Um, so if you, if, if you went through this process and you're getting two, two and a half inches of pre-bend, then that would tell me that I want to ease uh, my head stay uh, until I get three, three, to, three and a half. Um, and then vice versa, if you've got you know, four and a half or four, which I doubt you'd ever get there, uh, given the, the stiffness of the mast, um, then uh, you'd want to take some head stay on. But uh, it, it was a pretty pretty slick way to just double check the tuning. And uh, um, I, I found, I've, I've checked a couple other boats uh, since then, uh, different boats in the fleet, and nine times out of 10, I've, I've eased the head stays off a little bit. So I know on our boat, we're, you know, at that measurement, we're roughly um, 48 inches on the head stay, and that's measured. Uh, we got our little mark on the on the head stay, which is uh, made by pulling the head stay back um, to the mast, straight down the front of the mast, and marking the top of the the tape band at the gooseneck, and then putting it back out, hooking it on. Um, and then measuring from the intersection of the head stay and the deck up to that mark. And uh, on our boats, roughly 48 inches. Um, we've seen a little difference in geometry of the head stay placement. So uh, this method is a, is a nice uh, confirmation on that you've got your, your, the, the, max, you know, the max rate you need uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the pre band you need so that the main fits the mast in the light air. Uh, a, a, another good thing to check is uh, when you've got all this stuff set up is um, wind on your head stay so that you get the 
the ruler to read an inch, an inch and a half, and that'd be roughly your heavy air setting. Uh, so 20, 20 plus uh, knots. And then you might find that, you know, from 10 knots to 20 knots, you're halfway in between on that head stay. Uh, we tend to set up uh, on the longer side uh, on the Wednesday nights and, and, and error on that side. Um, but uh, sure. it's, a, it's a cool trick. And I, I you know, if any of you uh, have any questions on it, reach out to me anytime. So Will, I, Will I, can I just ask you a quick question? Because I, uh, you know, I know that Chet has this set up so that you have consistency between the range. So that what you're really trying to find, it sounds like, is your, your maximum light air setting, which is three and a half inches plus or minus a little bit of pre-bend and your heavier right. setting, right? Which is like as little as one inch. And so Correct. keeping that seven on the head stay as you lengthen or shorten the head stay is going to basically, and you're pulling the back stay on to get the seven, that's going to help you get to that, that three, three and a half number or one inch number. And then that, the distance between your, or how much you're spinning your head stay, that's your, it's your range, so to speak. So you'll Correct. find yourself somewhere in there, right? Correct. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. And then recording, you know, have, having a good mark on your head stay so you can, you can duplicate those settings without having to go through that whole process again of putting the, the uh, pre-bend tool up the mast and, and measuring that all out. If you mark it on your head stay, then you should be able to get, get there pretty quickly. It, it almost sounds like a, 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 a do it once for the season and forget it kind of deal because you have your range you know, once you kind of put it in, so does that Correct. make sense? Yeah. yeah, I would say a calibrated head stay is the way to go. And it's definitely worth the investment to do that because Will's right, you need to, you know, if you have a calibrated head stay, you can keep notes at what worked, what didn't work. And uh, I know I did, and it was really, really helpful to go back through the notes and look at the numbers we used for a certain condition. Yeah, I like the Ronstan turnbuckle up there. I think it's worth worth getting one of those because it's pretty easy to adjust and it's got the, the locking nut on the top. So you, know, you can set up pre-race, go up wind, check, check your settings. And if you want to lengthen it or shorten it, you can just turn down wind really quickly and uh, send someone up on the bow and really, you know, ease the back stay off and just under hand, you can hand turn and get to your marks that you want to get and, and then trim back in and go up wind. It's pretty nice. No ring dings or cotter pins or anything like that to deal with. Yeah, exactly. That makes it a lot easier. And there's that, uh, there's that gauge that we, you know, we do make available, but obviously you can make your, your own. This is, uh, this is not, not, not a shields mast, obviously, but the idea of being the same is that's, that's the main halyard there. And it's going through um, um, different ranges. It's actually, I believe, this is the centimeter side. But in any case, uh, just so that's how you kind of check your your mass bend deflection, right? So, yeah, exactly. You you pull so it up to to about you know just above the spreaders, pull the main halyard down, and then you can easily see the uh, the pre bend so, there. So it's on the inside part of the main halyard to the mass is what you're looking for. Gotcha. So all this is to get to where, Tim? I mean, this is, uh, you know, all kind of cool and making sure that the, you know, we're kind of controlling the head stay sag and, and how much the mass is bending, but what, what are we trying to really get done here? What's, what's the end line goal here? Yeah, so this is, this is part of it, how it affects the jib and, um, and how head stay sag affects the jib. So at the top, you see uh, tighter head stay, and this is what you're looking for in depowering conditions. You want to get that head stay nice and tight. So you can see that entry of the sail gets a little finer. Um, you see that the overall shape gets a little flatter. And um, uh, basically you're depowering. So you're trying to make the sail as flat as possible when you're in those depowering conditions. And it makes the boat a lot easier to manage. Um, if you go down to the lower picture, you see you have more head stay sag, you have a deeper overall sail, more powerful shape. Um, <clears throat> you see that the draft of the sail is a little bit farther forward and uh, um, the entry angle is a little bit deeper. It makes a more forgiving sail 
um, to drive to. And one thing to remember when you start sagging the head stay uh, a lot, like a shield takes a lot of head stay sag, is that if you sag the head stay and um, the halyard, jib halyard doesn't get released at the same time, the draft of the sail will actually move extremely far forward. So it will uh, it'll be too far forward, not what we call knuckle forward, and it, it will become um, hard to actually point because you'll get a bubble in the front of the sail and the, the, uh, the sail starts stalling a lot easier that way. So you have to remember when you um, sag the head stay, ease the halyard down and then uh, the draft it moves to the correct position at that point. Um, also, the other thing to keep in mind is when you start sagging the head stay, you can see from this picture that the, the middle of the sail rotates to leeward um, quite a bit. And the leaves of the sail now, because the, the luff of the sail is rotated to leeward, the leaves of the sail is gonna become a lot more sensitive to trim. It's a lot easier to stall. So, um, extremely important in light moderate air to watch that upper leech and make sure that upper leech telltale is flowing 90 to 100 percent of the time i would say in any time any situation where you're trying to accelerate um, <clears throat> and or in um, some chop or in bad air that should be flowing 100 percent of the time the trick is to trim in until it just that upper leaf telltale just starts to flip behind the sail and stall and then ease back out till it's flowing 100%. And uh, especially when you're sagging the head stay that much, extremely important to watch that upper leaf telltale. Yeah, that's the that's the gas pedal, right? The the jib the jib sheet and pretty easy to stall that that upper uh, that upper leech telltale. Yeah. That's probably where it really comes in critical, having somebody who's really on top of making sure that uh, that that jib is always drawn. You know, I, Will and uh, Will and I, were in, and you were talking the other day with Tim about the fact that you know I'd much rather sail a, a shields around the harbor with the jib up all day than than the main up all day, yeah. uh, just because it's just so much easier. You know, trying to sail a shields around with a with just the main up gets really tricky. So it's very critical. And all this stuff you're talking about, Tim, with the head stay sag and the power in the jib, you know, and what um, what Will was mentioning insofar as making sure you have your range right for your light air up to your to your real breezy conditions is, is the biggest difference maker insofar as setting the boat up, I think. Plus, you know, obviously the, the mass step and getting the rake right, so. Yeah, exactly. All right, next okay. slide. Yep. Here you got a, a picture of, you know, a fairly pretty sail set up. I think that that's one that you kind of like, Tim, insofar as how it was setting up and sag. Maybe you want to go through a couple of the triggers that you're looking for that make it so aesthetically nice. Yeah, you can see on this one that the that there's um, a decent amount of uh, head stay sag in that um, picture, and then you know we can focus on that middle draft stripe there. It's you know the entry angle looks right. The the draft of the sail is in the right spot. You know, there's a little bit of, um, of crow's feet coming out of the hanks, but not excessive. The, um, you know, one thing we were talking about the other day, uh, another key it, to looking at when you're trimming the jib is that middle batten, you know, the one by the spreader. If that is coming in, um, or, or running parallel to the uh, center line of the boat, that's about right. And then the next the upper batten is going to be twisting, you know, slightly off. But the the key is those tell those leech telltales flying. And there's times where you're powered up and you have people on the rail, and you have smooth water, <clears throat> and you have to fight for a, a lane. It's okay to have them stall temporarily, meaning trim, trim the sh um, sheet in, over trim temporarily to hold lane. And, but what's gonna happen is eventually the boat's gonna start slowing down because it's, it's harder to drive to, you're getting more stall off the reach of the sail. 
and eventually you're going to pay the price and the boat is going to slow down. But in flat water, you can get away with it longer and live in that lane until you get a better lane to tack, tack into. Uh, it might be a situation where you're stuck in a ley line and you just have to live there. But um, eventually easing that sheet and getting the flow back into the sail plan is going to help you uh, accelerate. So, uh, it, it, Tim Dawson, you're, you're still on the line, I hope. We haven't lost you. President. Ah, uh, President, awesome. Well, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, you're, you've been driving the boat a lot for the past couple of years, you know, and, and Tim was making a really good point about, you know, the jib trimmers focus on that, that telltale. Do you guys, with you and your jib trimmer, do you guys spend a lot of time having discussions? It seems to me that a lot of the, uh, the discussion about keeping the boat going forward needs to be between the jib trimmer and, and the helm. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. It's for sure. There's conversation about that. I kind of, <clears throat> as the helmsman, I kind of try to set the whole group up more in terms of, you know, for me, it always comes back to how the boat's balanced, which has to do with a lot of things, but you know, for the way the rudder situation is on the shields, you really want to be aiming it more than steering it. So if I'm having to turn the, move the tiller too much to go in a straight line, you know, we're clearly not set up right. So sort of in terms of, you know, pulling sails in and going upwind for the first time before the first start, sort of the first thing we always talk about more is how's the boat, how's the balance feel? And then we sort of move on to how much power we have and whether that's enough or whether we, you know, take a little more backstay, less backstay from there. But the jib trim goes into a lot of how the boat balances. If, if you're over eased on the jib, you get too much weather helm. So it's really important to get it all gotcha. together. So that's, again, that's, uh, you know, I think that's a pretty nice setup. I think Tim, you were mentioned about the headstay sag and fully powered up. You guys, uh, what do you guys want to kind of mention about the steering telltales a little bit in this in this shot? Is this a good time to kind of maybe think about what, what we're doing down here in this area and what you're kind of looking for with those telltales, speed mode, you know, versus point mode, et cetera? Well, the thing that, that stands out to me, which um, makes a lot of sense is that a sail should progressively have the telltales as you go higher up in the sail. The, the, the weather one should stand up slightly more um, towards the top of the sail. So you can see at the bottom that lured weather uh, telltale, excuse me, the uh, lower weather telltale is flying almost straight back. The next one up is, is flying a little bit higher and the next one up is flying a little bit higher. And that's about right. That's where you should be set up. Um, and you know that's a key that um, a lot of people use to set up the jib lead. You know, I, I hear some people say you should have them all, you know, flowing at, at the same or uh, uh, streaming back at the same time. And uh, that's one way to do it. But I always set up so that the, the uh, top telltale is starting to break just a little bit earlier. That actually kind of shows in this picture, I can see at least in this middle telltale from even with my reading glasses on, you can see that one's starting to lift and this is obviously in a, the steering telltale is in a speed, speed build mode, so. Is that, Will, do you, you set it up the same way? Yeah, the same, yep. All right, next slide. Yeah. This one you weren't as excited about how the sale set up, maybe you can, I mean, for a lot of folks just kind of looking at it, you maybe wouldn't think there'd be anything radically that different about it. But maybe you can point out a couple of things that you think that might make that look a little bit prettier. Yeah, so, the you know, it's hard to tell the difference between these two, but, you know, it's subtle differences and small changes. And that's what, you know, we're talking about here is making small changes and getting everything we can out of the um, power and speed of the boat. But if you look at that same draft stripe, the middle draft stripe, this one is showing a finer entry. And it's going to be a little bit harder to drive to. Um, and it's because the head stay is just not sagging as much. So it's a straighter head stay. And it's illustrating, you know, what we were talking about a few slides back is a tighter head stay is a, a flatter shape and a, a finer entry. So this, this shape 
would not be so good for light to moderate setup. It, it would be um, not forgiving, not very powerful, um, not a not a very efficient uh, shape. So it that's the big difference between the two. It's a finer entry and less head stay sag. Gotcha. I mean, you know, again, we can take a look at these, you know, for someone to just kind of look at it, they say, well, that that aft stripe is straight and that telltale's flowing. But as you noted, this this entry line probably gonna make it a little bit critical to drive to. So maybe maybe bone flat water, but the draft kind of sliding back as far as it is may not be so much fun to drive to. Yeah. So uh, you guys had gotten uh, a bunch of questions. Uh, uh, some of them have been kind of lingering on your in your emails and stuff, and you kind of dropped a few of them in here. And these are things that you get a lot of questions about. And uh, I think the first one is, do you adjust your head stay much? And if you do, what are the moves you'd make if you get caught with it too long or even worse, uh, too short during a race? So maybe you want to go through you know, a little bit about what those gear changes are, what you guys what tools you use for your head stay and uh, kind of, if you do get stuck, maybe. So Will, you Tim, want to, or Tim or any of those guys? Tim you, Dawson, maybe describe what Sure. Yeah. We, so we have one of the Ron Stan turnbuckles that you guys were mentioning earlier that are metered and it happens to meter between zero and 25. And it just so happens that our boat, it kind of corresponds to the wind speed, you know, I kind of, under 10, we seem to be at nine. When you get a little over 10, we seem to be at 12. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of, I think our total throw is the 25 millimeters. So it's just about an inch. Um, and then we just have probably four settings that we use most of the time other than we get outside the extremes. Um, as far as when you're at a range, if you end up being too long, what can happen is um, you can't pull on as much backstay as you might like without the main not looking right and the boat getting out of balance that way. Um, and then again, conversely, when you're, uh, when you're too short, you just, you have to make sure that you sail with a little less backstay and uh, just make sure you're able to twist the main enough while you're trying to get a lot of sag. I mean, it is one of the tricky parts with the shields, right? I mean, uh, you know, sailing on a Wednesday night, uh, in Newport, it, a lot of times you could go out, at, you know, leave the dock at six and you're pretty much going to be okay get, guessing what the conditions are. But at nationals or a big event where you leave the dock at 830 and you may not come in till four, you could go through a long range, even, even in one race. And so um, I'm just, you know, I think your point about being stuck too long uh, when the breeze comes up is actually something that may happen more often than not, right? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, uh, I would stay on the long side until um, it got really, you know, it was definitely windy enough to, to start putting it on. Now that happens pretty quickly at, you know, 15 knots, maybe 16 knots, and all of a sudden you get really overpowered. Um, and so I, I would stay long, I kind of agree with Will, I'd stay long as possible and then shorten up um, once we get into that condition and then quickly you have to be quite aggressive about um, getting short enough and going going right to your um, short head stay um, setting now yeah I, I remember but I think it was Buzzards Bay Nationals to, um, maybe it was 10 years ago but John Burnham you know he had a great day uh, the first day I think was super windy and um i remember sailing with jamie hilton and we it just took us too long to get the head stay short enough and it took us too long to get the lowers tight enough and by the end of that day we had it all dialed in but we already had three races so we you know john burnham had like a one one two or maybe all bullets and we came in that day and and he you know said he just you know was aggressive about you know getting to his heavier setting quickly so there is a point Just, where you have to move quickly and, and, and dial, dial things up. Right. And if it's happening during the middle of the day, right, you, you just send up the, the person you're getting along with the least up to the bow to spin it on, right? Is that what the, yeah, the usual yeah. drill? That's what we used to do. So um, a real quick question here, and, and it's, it's actually um, 
it kind of reverts back a little bit before we dive into the next ones, guys, is we talked about forcing it a lot of, uh, of bend or quote unquote pre-bend more um, when you're setting up the boat. And I think um, you guys were mentioning trying to get three and a half inches of pre-bend for, for light air. So you have a longer head stay and then less bend, quote unquote, in the mast uh, for heavier. And one of the questions is how do you kind of reconcile that difference? What, why are we trying to get the mast straighter or, or you know, with less preset bend in it uh, for heavier versus versus lighter? What, what, is, uh, so, what are we trying to reconcile? Yeah, that? so that's all about head state tension. And that goes back to what we're talking about with the sag and the tighter you make it, you get a flatter jib. So, you know, that's one of the things that, um, um, it goes back to uh, the back stay in a, in a stiff mast that doesn't bend um, quite as easily, translates the tension from the back stay to the head stay better. So if you imagine a, a mast that's not, um, that's stiffer and it takes more energy from the back stay or more tension from the back stay to bend it and flatten out the main it'll translate that tension to the head stay. So if you had a more flexible rig and you're and it's and it's windy and you're pulling your back stay on, you're gonna be pulling back stay, keep pulling it, your head stay is not getting tighter, you're now overbending the mass, you're making the uh, main look super ugly because you're getting overbend wrinkles. Uh, the other thing that's happening is you're bending it excessively and it's compressing. So actually the distance between the hounds and the deck is getting shorter. So now all your rig, your, you know, all your rig tensions are getting looser because your rig is essentially getting shorter because you're compressing it and bending it excessively. So if you have a stiff rig to start with, pull your back stay on, you use a lot of back stay tension to get the bend right for the mainsail shape, that tension will translate to a nice tight head stay and keep your jib flatter is what you're looking for in that condition. All right, so it's almost uh, it's almost like that you're trying to almost get the mass to bend consistently almost through all the ranges and it's really focused around the uh, dictating the power in the jib uh, to a certain extent and uh, would you kind of agree with that a little bit obviously when you start putting compression on the mast I wouldn't say that the shields mass bends a whole lot but um, it's certainly going to bend when you start stepping on the on the uh, on the backstay a lot so uh, a little bit circling to that question you're in your heavier setting and maybe this is for Will, uh, and you're, you know, you're as short as you want to be on your head stay, and it's blowing 25. Uh, can you pull your back stay too tight? If it's blowing 25, I don't think you can pull it tight enough. <laughs> <laughs> no such thing, right? Yeah, right? no, I don't think so. Yeah, and that's so. just, again, to transfer to get the, the head stay as straight as you can to flatten the jib out to depower that rig as much as you can. And if if you get the mass to bend more and twist at the top, that's all the better to keep the boat balanced, I would think. Yeah, no, I agree. Thank you. All right, so that's uh, that's a good uh, good thing. And uh, I think Tim mentioned really quickly another question. Uh, what's the range for tightening up the lowers from 300 to what? And as you know, we're getting more breeze. You mentioned that you you might be tightening the lowers. And what what's, might be your indicator you're looking for to make sure your, your lowers are good as you're getting into the 16, 18, 20 plus range. Yeah, so it's a combination of, of things. So in light air, you want the lowers loose and allow the, the mass to bend. And, um, you know, one of the things we spoke about is do we, do you know, do they get loose enough so you could see in light air to see side sag? Now side sag is when you sight up, you can look up the back or the front. I like to look up the front of the mast and see the mass actually sag at the at the spreaders. And these masts are so stiff that some masts, if you disconnected the lowers, you still wouldn't, in light air, you still wouldn't see any mid thin mass sag. But there are some masts, um, like on Jamie's boat, when I sailed with him, it was a stiff in that section, but I could, I could see a little bit of side sag, maybe quarter inch, just starting to side sag. And that was a sign to me that the lowers were loose enough. Gotcha. And what that was doing is, is letting it, you know, um, it's a, it, just telling me that the, they're loose enough that it's, it's free to bend forward as well as, as sideways. So that was 
um, in, in light air, that, that's the role of the lowers. So that's one thing on the way to the race course we would always talk about because we'd have it set at base at the mooring, we'd leave the mooring, we'd be sailing out and that would be the discussion on the race course. You know, do we ease the lowers more? Uh, or do we, if it's windy, do we tighten them? So that was a, you know, an easy change we could make um, in keep, keeping our head stay at the max length of position. Now, if it started white capping and we're depowering, then we talked about, okay, we got to take up turns on the lowers because we want to start stiffening the rig that we're talking about. And at the same time, if we're tensioning the lowers, we're going to turn the boat downwind and we're going to take up some tension on the head stay at the same time. If there's, if there was time, we'd, go back up wind again, look at the setup, see if the head stay, if it's windy, see if the head stays under control and not bouncing around and um, moving around much and it's under control. And then look up the main. Is the main, when I'm pulling on the back stay as tight as I want to get it to get the head stay under control, is the main looking good? Meaning, you know, minimal or no overbend wrinkles at that point. If, so, there's, uh, over, if there's overbend wrinkles at that point, I could take lowers on a little bit and see if that works, um, but I might want to take up a little bit more headset. Right. So lowers, lowers are a little bit behind where the mast sits through the partners. They they will kind of help uh, a little bit act as a kind of running backstage, but they're not going to help that much. But I think your your point about in the medium light stuff, you know, starting at eight and three, eight hundred and three hundred, and then you know not being afraid to fool around with them a little bit and get that that mast to sag in the middle. Uh, if it will, because that just could add a little bit more power to the main, I think, right? Yeah. yeah and help exactly. the mast bend down low. It's going to, you know, as yeah. you release those, it's not going to be pulling the mast back so much. Well, yeah. Let's, uh, let's, uh, and just one thing I want to add there, and we haven't touched on this a whole lot, is is light air and, and getting the pre-bend is, um, you know, we talked a lot about the head stay um, and, and getting that set right for the pre-bend, but it really is, in light air about having your back stay tensioned uh, properly and having marks on it so that you can control that sag and get it to where you want it to go. And that was a big deal. And, and, and I'll have Tim and Will talk about this a little bit, but that was a big deal on our boat is knowing exactly where those marks were on the back stay. And um, on Jamie's boat, we had a, a few different marks actually on the, the back say, and then we had a batten um, sticking up behind it so that it would correspond with some marks on the batten. But then the secondary reference would be, you know, as you're pulling it on, these marks would drop into the deck, so uh, below deck. So then you could count the marks up, you know, for quick reference as well. So that's what I used. And, and you know, every time um, we'd go upwind, I'd look back, you know, at where the mark was, make sure the setup was where I wanted. That way I could reference it when we started the race to make sure I get back to that setting. The same thing when we round the lured mark, um, you know, I do all the, all the gross tuning and then make sure I look back there at the back say and get that set to where uh, that same reference point um, on the back say. Is that, Tim, the way you guys do it on your boat? Yeah, we have um, four different, I think it's four, four different color um, things like marks stitched into the Dyneema pennant and we just use the whole reference going into the deck there. How about yeah, you, The same, yep, yeah, and, and we keep track of, we might even have a discussion, right? Like, you think we should be set up at four or five or three or whatever and you know, you make sure you get back to that setting before you come around the bottom mark. I would say for, for sure, guys, if you don't have a way to make it repeatable, I, you know, I'm gonna open up the archive books, but I remember, you know, when Chad was sailing Hawk back in 87, 88, I remember that was probably one of the first boats that would, you put a little uh, L bracket on and a, an old uh, Bainbridge blue batten with some numbers on it and just uh, so they could be repeatable with their, with their backstay. And, you know, obviously they had a great run for a bunch of years. And I think they were one of the first teams to just make sure that you could get, you know, repeatable marks. So that, that's a good, a good tip for, for everything, right? Whether it's, you know, uh, 
you know, your alcohol or whatever, making sure you have repeatable marks. So that's yeah. really awesome. So let me, uh, let's just slide to the next slide here, if we can, without crashing the program. Um, and uh, we kind of already stepped into this one. What do you do with your shrouds in terms of adjustment? You said it, forget it, or just, it, uh, or do you ever adjust them? So you guys, uh, you're omniscient. You kind of jumped ahead and uh, kind of already answered that question or at least touched on it for sure. I think if anybody has any specific questions or or confused them, feel free to reach out to anybody uh, by email or, or a phone call uh, and kind of go through that again. But uh, well, the ahead. one thing, Brian, is that, you know, we did talk about leaving the uppers, but um, Tim had that story about national. Oh, in Chicago, going, right, yeah, right, right, right. So, Tim, can you touch on that? Yeah, I mean, t typically because the spreaders are in line, the uh, the upper shrouds aren't really doing anything to control the shale, sail shape much or uh, affect how an inning's behaving. But um, at this year's nationals in Chicago, it was you know it had to be as windy as I've ever raced the shields. We were seeing you know puffs over twenty five fairly consistently, and on the last day before um, you know before the race, just going up wind, we just saw that the the lured upper shroud was just excessively slack and slopping around. And um, the, the offshore sailor in me isn't comfortable with that sort of thing because you never know what happens when you tack and something doesn't seat right, something bad can happen. But also just if that lured shroud's getting that loose, obviously the mast's just kind of leaning over the side of the boat and that can't be that can't be that quick either. So I think we probably, I think we, it was either two or three turns we ended up putting them on them in that day. And it was just sort of like, just to suck up some of that lured slack. But other than that, I don't think I've ever adjusted them. And yeah. what do you think your, your standard range is, Tim Dawson, on uh, what you play the lowers? I mean, like on our boat, we typically leave the uppers at 800 and we might take a couple turns off or on the lowers and we adjust the head stays. Is that roughly what you, you do on your boat as well, Tim Dawson? Yeah. Yeah, I would say we go two turns either way, plus two and minus two. Yeah. Ironically, the first year of the Nationals this year was super light, and I think we might have taken three or four off just to see how it looked. But typically, it's two and two, two less and two more. Yeah, same on our boat. Yeah, that's the same with us. Interesting. I don't think uh, in all the years I sailed Shields, I don't think I ever – change the uppers that's interesting i'm wondering how much of that tim was just from you guys stepping on the back say so much and getting a little compression and softening the rig that, rig that way but um all right let's step on to the next one here and uh this is uh this is pretty important part of kind of making sure everything sets up right with the jib tack and the question was how about jib tack height how much you play it and if so what you do and why and will wells i i know you guys have kind of played with this a little bit. I want to get your thoughts on, on what you're trying to get done here and why it's important where, where we're putting the tack. Yeah, no, happy to. This is a great uh, photo of uh, how we set ours up on our boat. And uh, so basically the design, the, the, the jib with the foot rounds all designed to basically have the tack float off the deck uh, four inches. And uh, that still keeps the foot round engaged with the deck, which is nice. And uh, the only thing I would add is, as you can see in this photo, the tack's tied forward so that it's taking the load, not the next hank up, the first hank. And uh, that's pretty crucial because if you don't have that, you trim on the, the sheet, um, that uh, tack will float aft and the bottom hank will load up and you'll lose all the shape out of the bottom of the sail. So pretty crucial to, to tie it forward like that. And uh, like I said, four inches off the deck, we rarely change it from four inches. Sometimes, uh, you know, if it's, if it's quite windy conditions and we're gonna be nailing our, our, our head stay down, going to 46 or whatever it is, uh, we might, take our tack all the way down at that point too. But I'd say that's 20 knots plus. So on average, uh, an average Wednesday night in Newport, you know, it's beautiful. It's eight, eight to 12, right? And sunny, uh, we leave it right at four all the time. Not much change on, on, the, on, the, on that setting or even the shrouds or the head stay. So Will, why do you, why do you uh, in heavy air, why do you pull it down? 
just to reduce, you know, get everything a little lower. Seems seems to work quite nice. Lower the sale down. So, Will, you were mentioned the other day, and we've talked about this. You know, it's interesting. You, you really do have to tie that tack forward, um, otherwise okay. it will float back. And uh, we talked about trying to put a hank or something on there, but the, the variety of different turnbuckles that we had over uh, the years of people building shields, it's almost impossible to get some sort of hank down there that will do the job as well as tying it forward. Would you oh, kind yeah. of agree with that? Yeah, no, we'd love to put a little little hank right there above the uh, the grommet there at the tack, but uh, you know, that's a pretty, that's probably the lowest profile uh, shields head stay there is. And most people have an open body with uh, one of the white rollers that goes over the top of it. So uh, way too big for a hank and uh, you know, a, 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 a nice uh, soft shackle or just tying a piece of spectra and pulling it forward. You know, that all works just quite nicely. Gotcha. But it's a must. Gotcha. I see, uh, I guess uh, Anthony Katoon now knows where all of his shackles went. So, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the other thing I want to point out and, and ask you guys a quick question because this, you know, this isn't in the questions, but we're talking a little bit about how this affects jib lead and where the jib lead sets up. And I want to get your ideas. Listen, I'm old school. Uh, and I've been doing sales and shields back 30 years, and, and we would always kind of leave that. that jib track at the T and I'm just wondering your thoughts, especially with the tack being up four inches and how often do you guys fool with that? And Will, what effect does it have when you do pull that down maybe to that two inch thing? And do you think that, uh, does that make a change in your jib lead? Uh, maybe Tim Dawson or, or, or Will can kind of weigh in on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer it a little bit. Obviously, well, as you raise the tack up, the lead moves back on the track and as you uh, lower the, the tack down on the deck, the lead needs to go forward. Um, in, in heavy air, we might move the lead back a little bit anyhow, so we'd probably split the difference a little bit by taking the tack down. Um, but, uh, you know, our, our base for our, our uh, jib lead is, is pretty much with the block even with the track that's, uh, that's on the boat. Okay, how about you? Uh... Tim Dawson, you, you have an idea about kind of where you're sitting? I know you guys do two to one, I think, right? Yeah, so we just have a fixed loop on the tack. So we never adjust the tack, just sort of in the interest of keeping things simple and getting off the mooring easy on a Wednesday afternoon and making the start on time. Um, but, but yeah, we do have the, we use the two to one jib sheet and we pretty much, you know, get pretty close to two block in some of the time dependent as long as the jib halyard and the jib leader are in the right place. And we probably use, spend most of the time in two different holes on the jib track, get to a third in the extremes, but it's really just the, just the two. And there is one spot that we have where you could make the argument that if we did change the tack height a little bit, it would help us because we do have one spot in our range of head stay length where we, can't really use because it would put the jib lead in like a screw hole. Okay. And uh, Tim, Tim Healy, the other thing I wanted to kind of ask you about, especially when we're, since we're talking about jib leads, is you were mentioning about how the halyard affects that a little bit. And I'm just wondering, you know, you maybe just want to weigh a little, a little bit about halyard tension yeah. and where that kind of affects your, how you're trimming the jib while we're talking yeah. about this. Yeah, I think, um, you know, conditions change during a race, you know, can change drastically in one leg. And as you're going and changing your halyard tension, um, let's, an example, you start the race in 10 knots and by the weather mark, you're in five knots and you're moving, uh, you're easing your jib halyard because you want to keep the scallops in the sail. You want to keep a nice, powerful shape. Um, and as you do that, you're easing halyard, the, the sail is actually getting lower. So you're, the geometry of the sail is changing. So uh, what, what's happening is you're effectively uh, moving the lead aft, which may not be what you want to do. So lowering the sail, if you left the lead where it was, it's kind of acting like the lead is moving aft because the whole sail is getting lower. So at that point, you know, what I always, um, try to remember and, and key into the, 
the trimmers on the boat is that anytime you make a halyard change um, looser, you should be thinking lead forward. And um, remember that, uh, especially if you're starving for power, that if you ease the halyard uh, quite a bit, just move a lead forward that half a hole or a full hole to, to build in that shape in the bottom of the sail you want. Now, if you get to, you know, under five knots to four knots to three knots, these sails are built heavy because we need them to last long. So at that point, you're, you're trying to open up the, the leech and keep flow going. So you're moving the lead aft just to try to promote as much twist as you possibly can. Now, that happens typically if you're all, all sitting to lured, you know, that's another key. Move the lead back a little bit, you know, get the, get, if you're having trouble twisting the sail and keeping the flow going, you know, just, just sneak that lead back a little bit and uh, it'll help open it up. And one comment I wanted to make is, you know, our, our chat room got hijacked at the beginning of this call. So uh, Laura opened it up again. So if, if you want to ask some questions now, it's open and we can help answer questions, but um, we had to close it because it got hijacked early on here. So if they start, po questions start popping up, we're, we're happy to address them. Gotcha. Yeah, we did, uh, did have, just like I think uh, we're not immune. I, I understand that's the new thing is hacking Zoom things. And we're, we're still learning how to do this really good. I think it was, we're really focused on trying to get some fun information to get people through this next period of time as we're all kind of struggling and trying to get excited to get back on the water. So I uh, appreciate you guys being patient with us. Um, so uh, kind of touched on this a little bit. Tell us what uh, the other question we got earlier. Tell us what you're looking at when you're trimming, setting up the jib, and do you play the halyard much? And what are you looking for there? And I guess I probably could have switched this slide a lot quicker because you kind of just went over that, Tim. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, with halyard tension with these guys, I see uh, – I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on those those couple crow's feet coming out of those bottom two or three snaps. Is that kind of a, a nice look, especially in a newer jib for you, you think? Yeah, I think that that looks good. I mean, I I remember, you know, playing the halyard, I wouldn't say aggressively, but the big um, key to me is when you have people going from on the rail like the – they are right now they're leaning out obviously they've got plenty of power at that point but when you start moving bodies in that's the key all right look at the halyard do we need to ease the halyard a little bit and then you know vice versa if you end up getting out in in, in an extended puff that's going to last minutes then it's worth sending somebody in to take a quick you know um you know, quick adjustment on the halyard and pulling it up and getting rid of some of those, those scallops. So it is worth um, adjusting during the upland leg. There's no question about it, but I think you have to look at, you know, the length of the, how long that puff's going to last because it might be better just to hike through that puff if it's only going to last, you know, 10 or 20 seconds. Okay. And there was actually a quick question someone's asking about, um, uh, lateral sag playing into jib trimming when you guys were mentioned about easing the uh, the lowers uh, try to get the the main this or the I'm sorry the mass to sag in the middle does it really have that much effect on what's happening with the head stay or are you just trying to make sure that you're getting more power into the main yeah so I'll answer it and I want to hear from Tim Dawson as well but it, it does it affects as the head stay sags uh, in light to moderate condition, it makes, you know, the whole luff of the sail rotates to leeward and um, the leech of the sail becomes much more sensitive to trim, to over trimming. And that's exactly what you don't want in light to moderate air. If you over trim, you stall the sail, you lose um, any, any drive that the sail's giving you pretty quickly. So it, it becomes, the leech becomes more sensitive. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. And that's just uh, that's just from low. Just, I'm sorry, Tim. Just 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 when you're when you're easing the lowers of light stuff, you think it's having that kind of effect on on the head stay. Um, or maybe yeah, I think that okay. I think easing the lowers affects the head stay. Sorry, maybe I didn't understand the question. But no, no worries, no worries. I I do. I think that does affect, it, especially when your your back stays on the 
ease side of things, but for sure the back stay is having way more effect on your head stay tension and your lowers really are controlling um, the amount of uh, uh, bend that's allowed or is happening in, in, your, in your mast. So you wanna gotcha. be able to ease those up in light air and, and allow it to bend. Gotcha, and that makes sense, right? I mean, and using a little bit of back stay in the real, real light stuff. Yeah. So let's just uh, let's just step here. We got two or three more quick questions. Uh, what are you looking uh, for trimming, setting the mainsail, upwind and downwind? And uh, just a couple of pictures of downwind. Uh, obviously, what we have one with the bang on and one with the bang off. Uh, and maybe you guys can just touch a little bit about uh, you know how the main's kind of twisting with that bang off and maybe not making the boat as much fun to sail. I'm willing to listen to any of you. Tim, uh, well, Dawson, you're around? Yeah, so, well, you know, obviously I think we're looking at the picture to the upper left is a little nicer vang set up as far as, as far as that goes. And I think the way that you want to look at that with how low you sail is, if anyone does not much opti, like watching opti sailing, there seems to be a lot of talk about like the active leech and kind of that top bat and just sort of flickering a little bit in, you know, sort of moderate conditions like that, I think is right. And then when it gets windier, the harder you pull that thing on, the safer it'll be. Yeah, so sometimes might be a little counterintuitive, right? To some people thinking that they're going to ease the bang and, and uh, you know, twist off the top of the sail and depower the sail at the top with the main. But especially in a boat as narrow and, and rocky and rolly as, a, as the shields can get in big breeze and, and wind, uh, having the vang on pretty hard is, is pretty important to keeping the thing under control. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, I agree but with that. That's what I'll whine about most coming around the weather market, a bunch of breeze is the vang being too east because it gets, can get scary fast. Right. The, 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 the Nationals in Chicago, Kyle Martin is quite sure that we got the thing planing. And if we had not had the vang on super hard in that condition, we would have tipped over in some way for sure. Yeah, I think Brian, the way that I look at it is that, you know, the picture on the left is, is much nicer, obviously, but setting the vang um, downwind and having somebody keep an eye on it is fairly important because you get in the condition where you can pull back, let's say eight, nine knots, maybe 10 knots, you can pull way back. And occasionally you can sail by the weight and, and uh, you, you don't wanna do it for extended periods of time, but you can do it occasionally, especially if you need to clear your lane. And um, I wouldn't recommend doing it for very long because again, you'll start sailing slower. But at that point, you know, at eight, nine knots and you're sailing by the lee, I think it goes with what Tim Dawson was saying. You ease the vang just a hair and you get the upper leech to open slightly, not as much as that picture in from one to one um, to the right there, but just slightly and you get start getting a reverse flow. And that reverse flow up on the leech of the main is, is will give you just a little bit added power so that you can, you know, extend that, that amount that you're sailing by the lee. And then, you know, if you get back, um, back to normal, and uh, then you could just put a tiny bit of bang back on again. And the rule of thumb is um, have it parallel to where the boom is, if not just a hair open to where the boom is when you're sailing dead downwind. downwind. And then, you know, I agree 100% when it gets windy, that's the number one factor that's going to keep you under control. If that upper leech is open, you're going to get the wobbles and, and it's going to be really hard to drive the boat. You know, one thing I just want to add on that, you know, most of us know this from sailing shields in heavy air, but the, the van going on, but also somebody um, whose job it is to you know, hold the, the uh, guy. Um, you know, if, if the rolls get out of control, just burping the guy forward a foot maybe two feet to start with to get the boat back under control and then pulling that guy back again um, will help you steer the boat because if that guy stays back in, uh, in a big puff and the boat starts rolling out of control, um, you know, that's what's triggering that is that, that uh, it gets the boat off balance. So if you burp it forward, it'll get the boat back up, back on its feet and then you can get back to sailing again. 
Yeah, I, um, uh, you know, somebody was actually just uh, questioning, and you, you bring up the point about, you know, two people flying the, the Spinnaker or just being able to have access to the guy. Where, where do you guys keeping people going downwind? Obviously, light air versus heavier, you might have some different locations. Are you just trying to, to keep the weight over the keel, or you sliding back, you sliding forward, you working people outboard as far as you can to keep the boat balanced? What are your crew weight thoughts going downwind, depending on the wind conditions? There's definitely a big change sort of power threshold with the, with the shields. And it's probably like any time the pole is sort of further forward than say 45 degrees or so, I think it's pretty important to have the, the weight to leeward, you know, basically hiking to leeward. And, you know, it really just sort of helps the sails um, spinnaker set. <clears throat> and then as, but as soon as you can start pulling it back to, uh, you know, past 45 degrees and you start trying to soak a little bit it's key to get weight to windward as nearly as much as you can like everybody to windward it just helps get the helm more balanced same as upwind it just gets the boat going straight downwind and trying to soak a little bit and you keep doing that right up until you start healing to windward too much and sort of rounding down going downwind and then you you know kind of balance the weight out on the rails but only down to leeward or you know only down in the boat in very very light air Gotcha. So I did four and a half. You got the two or three people in front kind of still in front of the bench and then one person on the bench and then the helm. Is that still kind of your four and a half position? Everyone just kind of fits in there. It's pretty crowded. <laughs> gotcha. We leave one on the bow too, typically. Okay. Not, right. a, not in big breeze, but in light and medium. So we talked a little bit about mainsail upwind uh, as well. So we're, we're gonna kind of touch base, but the vang is a big deal, making sure someone's kind of, you know, Tim's point of keeping that flow. And as the breeze comes on, you know, this 121 picture, if you start to get that twisty and it's blowing 20, uh, you kind of start getting to that death rolly thing sometimes and that makes it a little bit more uncomfortable to sail the boat for sure. So let's uh, let's just step onto the next slide here real quick and we we're gonna have a couple questions uh, so uh, when you have a case of those flows where do you where do you look first what do you sail trim sail trim Anybody? for sure yeah <laughs> yeah make, making well, sure the, the spanker <laughs> sheet that's the first yeah. thing <laughs> Uh, I think a lot of the things you guys touched on, right? Uh, obviously, making the boat, making sure the boat's set up right, uh, and knowing the range you have to go through, and knowing if you're on the wrong side of the range, you're going to have to make some adjustments uh, to uh, to counteract going slow. And uh, I'm not sure. You know, obviously, you guys are at the top of the fleet uh, a lot of the time, but do you ever kind of look over to one of your competitors or somebody that you know usually goes pretty well and say, you know? I see where their main set up or I see where their jib is trimmed. Do you kind of say, hey, you know, imitations of best form of flattery. And if you think you're going slow, maybe kind of just match them. Would that be something you guys might do? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I look all the time, you know, going upwind crossing tax with, um, with the fleet and see where their traveler setup is, um, you know, try to get an idea how much backs they have pulled on see how much twist they have in their jib, um, all those things. But the, the one thing that stands out, you know, it's easy to check is traveler height. And so if somebody's outperforming you, you know, that's nearby, you can quickly reference their traveler height and um, you can set it there and then get reset your twist and then talk with the helmsman again about how the helm feels and see if that works any better. But that's, that's one, you know, one thing to check that's pretty easy to see from boat to boat. I think that holds true for any, any boat you're sailing, right? If I have a case of slows and I don't know why I'm going slow, I'm going to go find somebody that I think is going fast and try to do what they're doing. You know, that's a, a quick band-aid until you kind of make sure that you, you got circled back on all your settings. So hopefully that kind of answers that question a little bit. Um, before we get to this one, real quick, I want to get your guys' thoughts on three things you, you think about to make the shields go fast. And, and it, it'll be interesting if you guys all have the same three things. And there is one quick quick question about, um, with the force they set for heavy air, uh, have you measured the mass bend with the maximum amount of backstay? And I'm not sure there's such a thing as maximum amount of backstay, but I guess there is depending on how, who's pulling it. Um, but how much do you think that uh, with the force stay as short as you'd be, 
how much do you think the mass is actually bending? What would be your, your I have not put uh, a gauge on uh, with short head stay and no sails up and just tried to bend the crowd, bend the mast. I'm just wondering, what do you, how much you guys think it's bending? I, I, I'd be surprised if it's a lot, but. It's easily six inches. I was going to say it's probably five to six. Yeah, it's probably, probably more than that. But you think more than six inches? I think it's it's somewhere in that neighborhood. It could be a little bit more, but you know, I think that it, it, the important part is is what does the main look like? So if you're starting to see those overbend wrinkles, which are those those diagonal wrinkles coming out of the uh, the mass somewhere around the spreader window. And if they're getting big and they're extending, um, you know, into the, towards the clue of the sail, then you know you've got excessive bend. And so you have to either back off on the back stay hair, or if you're in between races and you have time to adjust the head stay and lowers, then it's time to, you know, put the, put the head stay on a little bit tighter and maybe put a turn on the lowers and see if you can get rid of those and then pull the back stay back on again. You know, what you're looking for there is that mainsail shape, but, but really you, you want to look at the head stay tension as well. And if that head stays under control at that point, then you know you've got enough uh, back stay on. So that's a great tip too, these, these overbed wrinkles, right? Just to making sure that the, the mass is matching the, the left curve of the main. And if we're starting to get those 45 degree um, overbed wrinkles coming out of the mass underneath the spreader window, just about to where these are. I mean, I think if that, that looks pretty good. So, but you know, what's your guys thought? Is that kind of a good indicator to make sure you guys kind of know your head stays close and you haven't overcooked the, the amount of bend in the mast? Yeah, I think that's the best indicator. That's what we focus on on our boat. Yeah. So let's let's get these real quick. I know we're we we started at five oh nine as promised, <laughs> but um, we're getting to be about six ten six twelve. We wanted to keep these close to an hour, but real quick, uh, I'm going to each ask each one. What are your top three things you think about to make the shields go faster? We'll start with the reigning national champion Tim Dawson. Balance, balance, and balance. You know, for the driver, that's all it is. It's you want to be able to just have the slightest amount of weather helm and the, ba the boat basically wanting to sail itself at the right angle to the wind. And from there, it sort of turns into a discussion of power. You know, like if, we ha if you have sort of a little bit of weather helm and you're, the boat's going straight and you don't have to steer it much, but, you know, maybe you're a little lower than you need to be, well, you need more power. So, and that helps you get sort of back up on the wind to the right angle. And oftentimes you'll find that you use the backstay and the boat will like instantly heal just from that extra power. So those are, those are really the, the two keys for the driver as far as I'm concerned is, is having the boat balanced, sailing basically by itself in the direction it should be going at the right angle of the wind and, and having the right power to make it do that. And how about you, Will Walls? What do you think are three, three things you're thinking about when you're on the boat, making sure the boat's going fast? What are you looking for? Yeah, well, I think know, knowing your settings and uh, being able to repeat them through marks and, and things like that. Um, but then, you know, being comfortable with them, but not get, don't get lost in them, right? So that, that'd be one. And then, um, uh, uh, you know, steering, steering with the sails um, and, you know, and not the rudder, I think is pretty huge thing with the shields, you know, a lot of boats, but especially with the shields, because they're, the rudder doesn't do that much that quickly. So really, you know, being attentive to the sail trim, and making the boat go fast and straight through the water, I think is pretty important. And then I, I'd say the, you know, when, when a boat's, when a shield is going slow, uh, nine times out of 10, I see people over trimming the sails, especially the main. And I think if, if you know, the way the sail plan is on the shields, if you over trim the main, the boat just wants to round it in the wind anyhow, right? So be be careful of over trimming the main. And, uh, you know, I look at the top telltale and, uh, you know, I trim it in. So it just starts to stall a little bit. Um, and that's, you know, it's probably, you know, max in would be two, three degrees in past parallel to the boom. And, uh, you know, I, I, I probably live uh, more than not at 100% flow, just ease right back out. So it's just flowing 100%. Okay. 
Awesome. That's that's great. And then uh, Tim Healy, uh, you know, maybe three things that you're thinking about that when you hop yeah, on the so phone. From the tactician uh, main trimmer uh, perspective, I think, you know, Tim Dawson's, you know, he's right that it's the balance. So it's the communication with the helmsman talking about how the helm feels and um, and judging the speed from your boat to uh, the, the boats around you and figuring out how to make changes quickly. So if you're, you know, you're not quite going as fast as you think you should be, you're not getting to the uh, faster than the boats around you, then you need to be looking around and making changes quickly to the setup. And it could be a little traveler height, it could be a little back stay on, it could be, um, you know, main sheet ease. And I agree with Will that sometimes all it takes is easing the main sheet just a hair and all of a sudden the boat livens up. So that's what I look for with balance. You know, the other things are the key points that we talked about are a, a flexible, forgiving rig in light air. And that means, uh, you know, getting the proper amount of head stay sag and having your marks on your back stay to control the head stay sag and control the bend in the mass so that you have a, a, um, uh, a flatter shaped main that doesn't stall out as easily in light air. So you can trim it on without it stalling out. And that goes back to what Will was saying about main sheet trim. It's easy to stall your main in light air if you don't have the right pre-bend and have the back stay on where it should be. And then when it gets windy, getting a nice stiff rig um, so that you can use a lot of back stay and transfer that tension to the head stay and get a nice flat jib shape. That's awesome. That's all obviously good tips. And there's a lot to cover when you say on the shields, right? Uh, I just remember, you know, uh, again, seven time national champion, Chad Proctor, he, he would say that, you know, the helm is probably the, you know, all he got to, all his job was to do was hold the tiller straight. And yeah. I think you kind of talked about, you know, especially Tim talking about it from his perspective as a mainsail trimmer, you know, the communication with the helm, you know, and, and so we, uh, you know, what the helm feels and stuff like that. So all really, really good tips. Uh, well, we, we, we kind of got out of the gate like a glue horse and finished like secretariat. So I appreciate you guys uh, with your patience uh, trying to get through all this. So you guys had some great tips. Uh, if anything wasn't at all clear, uh, we sure would appreciate you guys just sending us a note or giving any of us a call and uh, spend some time chatting with you all and, and see if we can, we can answer some of your questions online. We're going to plan a couple more of these, obviously, uh, with the current situation, with what's going on in the world. Um, we got some time on our hands so we can get back on the water. Uh, we're going to try to get Jed Prockner to come on board next time, maybe talk a little bit about sail design and uh, his thoughts about trying to make a shields go fast. So we're, we'll, uh, we'll try to rope, rope him in next time if we can, we can get him. I know he's on his way back from spending a few months in, in Florida in, in the sunshine. So, uh, Tim uh, and Tim and Will, do you have any uh, quick closing remarks you guys want to say or share with anybody? No, just thanks everybody for attending and yeah, reach out at any any point if you have any other questions and um, you know anything you want to cover in the next one. So thank you. So uh, I, I agree. Uh, be safe, everybody out there. Again, we appreciate you coming and joining us. Uh, and if anybody has any questions for the next one or you want to uh, see some topics covered send a quick email to, uh, to any of us and we will make sure we get them queued up. Probably in the next two or three weeks, we'll probably try to do another one for y'all. So be safe out there and uh, enjoy and we will be in contact. All right, thank you. Signing thank off. Thank you.